Welcome. In today's video, I'll be taking you through casting a propellant grain for my upcoming motor, SN5. I've picked up a lot of techniques over the time, and surprisingly, casting the propellant has been one of the toughest parts of building my high-powered rocketry motor. I hope to share some of what I've learned so you don't make the same mistakes I have. Over the past year, I've been designing and building custom high-powered rocket motors. The main goal of this program is to create a reliable, high-performance, reusable, sugar-based rocket motor. To do that, I need to make my own rocket fuel. The main ingredients in my propellant are sugar and potassium nitrate. For the sugar, I use sorbitol. This acts as the fuel. The potassium nitrate serves as the oxidizer, supplying oxygen to the fuel. I use two different mesh sizes of potassium nitrate to slightly improve performance. I also add small amounts of red iron oxide to help the propellant ignite more easily and also slightly boost performance. Here's my propellant formula that works best for my setup. If you're making your own motor, I highly recommend testing and optimizing for your specific needs. The early days of my casting process were rough. There were many failed propellant grains, and producing a full-size grain was tedious and took way too long. I used to cast three smaller sections, then trim them, and fuse them together afterwards. This method worked, but it was time-consuming and inefficient. Before we get started, this video is for educational purposes only. Just because you watch this video doesn't mean you're that's a cop. Just because you watch this whole video doesn't mean you're fully qualified, so please do your own research, understand the materials, and follow all safety precautions. For this new method, I designed a custom top plate, bottom plate, and finisil. The finisil is used to increase the burn surface area of the propellant, which in turn enhances the mass flow rate and thrust levels. The top plate sits here, centering the corn rod. The bottom plate goes here, keeping the finisil aligned and the propellant contained. The finisil sits inside of the propellant and is removed after casting. I use a silicone tube with a bolt through it to connect the finisil and core the propellant. As you'll see, this method is a bit like building a skyscraper. You start from the bottom and you build your way upwards. Starting off, I lubricate the base plate so the propellant releases easily during demolding. Then, it's time to assemble the corn rod. The corn rod has three main parts, the finisil, the rod, and the silicone tube. First, I start by attaching the silicone tube to the rod. The rod gives the silicone tube added rigidity. The rod is slightly shorter than the tubing, so the finisil can be attached. Here, I'm showing the finisil being attached, but it actually won't be attached until after the first pour. The silicone tubing doesn't need any lubricant, but the finisil needs a lot. Its large surface area makes it very tough to remove after casting. Once that is done, I insert the finisil into the designed spot in the base plate. Then I tape and hot glue the cardboard liner to the base plate. This helps it stay snug when tamping to remove air bubbles. I will only start off with one cardboard segment even though the full grain will be around two and a half segments long. This keeps the process more manageable. With prep done, it's time to cast the propellant. To start, I measure out 34.13 grams of milled potassium nitrate. Quick tip, since we're doing multiple pours, label your containers to avoid chemical cross-contamination. When working with fine chemicals like the potassium nitrate, be sure to work in a well-ventilated area and keep the dust down. You do not want to inhale this stuff. Before adding it to the mixing jar, I add it to a plastic bag and mash it up. The milled potassium nitrate tends to clump up from moisture in the air. This helps break up any large clumps, and then I add it to the mixing jar. Next, I measure out 63.38 grams of granular potassium nitrate. Since it also clumps up from moisture, I keep silica gel packets in both containers for storage. Then I add it to the mixing jar. Next, I measure out 52.5 grams of sorbitol. I'm tapping the jar a lot to help some of the sorbitol come out from what I'm guessing is static buildup. Finally, I measure out 1.87 grams of red iron oxide and add it to the mixing jar. Once everything is measured, I shake the jar for a full minute to make sure everything is thoroughly mixed. Now it's time to heat the propellant until it becomes a liquid and pour it into the liner. I set the hot plate to medium until the propellant just starts melting and then lower it to low. 
This is one of the most dangerous parts of making your own propellant. Be very careful not to spill any of the propellant onto the hot plate. Even on low temperature, it will ignite. I stir constantly, breaking up any of the clumps of the potassium nitrate and to ensure the mixture is heated evenly. After about 5 minutes of stirring, it becomes fully liquid. I heat until 250 degrees Fahrenheit. As I mentioned, for the first pour, I do not attach the coring rod to the finisil. This keeps things less cluttered and makes pouring easier. The first pour is by far the hardest and the one I've messed up the most. It really helps having someone spin the liner so each chamber around the finisil fills evenly. Once filled, I quickly clean off any excess propellant on the top of the finisil and insert the coring rod. Then I pour the remaining propellant. Next, I add the top plate and tamp for 10 minutes. Removing air bubbles is critical. They are not good for the rocket's performance. Instead of this method, I have tried one big pour, and this led to large air bubbles and a ruined grain. Smaller pours are more safe and more manageable. Now I let it set for 3 hours and hit a few golf balls. Once the first pour is done, I secure the next section with regular painter's tape. I won't bore you with measuring and melting again, it's the same every time. While my girlfriend measures the chemicals, I tape three small pieces inside the liner to help better secure it to the next section. You can see two of the three pieces in this shot. Then I heat the propellant and pour it into the casing. The next pours are much simpler than the first one. Now I clean off any extra propellant on the corn rod or liner and add the top plate. Then I tamp for another 10 minutes. Then let it sit for another 3 hours and hit some more golf balls. After the second pour, we're on to the third. Same process, once poured, tamp, then wait 1 hour. Before the fourth pour, I add the final liner segment. Then I add the last full pour of propellant. It may look like it's done, but once it sets, the propellant will shrink. To account for that, I wait 24 hours before doing the final small top off pour. This last pour just makes the surface flush with the top of the liner. I save any leftover propellant to reheat later for making igniters. Once hardened, it's time to demold. I start off by removing the corn rod. This can be tough due to suction. Then I remove the bottom plate to reveal the finisil mold. I do tend to sometimes get small air bubbles at the bottom, but that's okay. To get the finisil mold out, I set the propellant on top of a vise and use a dowel to tap the mold out. If you use enough lubricant, it will slide out nicely. And just like that, the propellant grain is done. To calculate how much propellant I have, I do not use how much was measured out in each pour. Not all of it gets out. Instead, I know the weight of the casing and tape, so I weigh the full grain and then subtract. When storing the grain, you do not want it in contact with moisture. I forgot to record wrapping it, but I did record unwrapping it, so here's a reversed clip. I first wrap it in a paper towel and tape it down. Then I put it in a plastic bag with a couple silica gel packets and seal it airtight. Then I put it into another plastic bag. And just like that, I turn these four ingredients into rocket fuel. This propellant will be loaded into SM5 for its first static fire. After reviewing the footage and data from SM4, I've gotten a good idea of what went wrong and how to fix it. SM5 static fire is planned for June 14th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to be live streaming this test and that live stream will start around 30 minutes before ignition. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe and stay tuned for SM5's video.